guys got the heat on in here? <laughs> Damn. <laughs> I had to turn the air conditioning on because it's going to get full of hot air. <laughs> I normally don't cuss from the podium, but I kind of feel like it right now. I'm Jerry Weaver. I'm an alcoholic. Sobriety date is July 2nd, 1989. My home group is a group called There Is a Solution. We meet in Holly Springs. We've got some home group members here tonight. Um, we meet on Tuesdays and Thursdays at 7 o'clock, if you're ever in Holly Springs. We're actually not far up the road. Some of y'all come up and visit every once in a while. We appreciate that. Um, I got a sponsor as well, and I, uh, I appreciate um, all the folks that rode with me and some of the other folks from Raleigh that came. It's, uh, it's good to have friends today, good to, uh, to be in the right mind, and um, I appreciate the group asking me to come out got a lot of friends in, in this group and two of my two of my real life heroes in this group Tom obviously who's not here and and Wallace <laughs> Wallace is a good man and uh, I uh, I appreciate his, uh, his friendship and the example that he set for a lot of people for a long time I uh, 28 years ago to the day I was discharged from the Air Force and I was absolutely convinced that by being discharged from the Air Force that I would quit drinking. And I had, uh, for, for about six months prior to being discharged from the Air Force, I had tried a lot of ways to quit drinking. I tried church. I, I drank in the church bathroom while the guy was preaching. I tried psychiatry. I didn't appreciate what they were telling me, what I needed to do, and... Uh, I tried shaving my head, and I thought that if I shaved my head that I'd get to have a new spiritual experience and would be able to stay sober, and uh, I would read the, the, the New Testament and listen to gospel music and exercise and try to eat healthy. I, had this, I was on this kick one time if I just <laughs> ate fruits and vegetables that, that I would probably be able to stay sober and exercise, and, um, and none of that worked, and I had a lot of well and well-intended people had helped me try to stay sober, try to get sober family members, chief of police, Harney County deputy. <laughs> um, and no matter how hard I tried, I couldn't stay sober. I'd make promises to my wife that I was going to go to the store and come straight home, or I was going to go to work and come straight home. And somewhere in between, my mind would mess with me, and I would inevitably stop off at, at the convenience store and get some beer, or I would stop off at a friend's house and start drinking, and the next thing you know, it'd be two or three days later. I'd come home full of guilt and full of remorse, make a bunch of promises to not do it again. Might do that for, uh, I might stay sober 30 minutes, I might stay sober three days. I got suicidal, attempted suicide three times. They tell me that I died twice. Um, I remember one of them. And uh, each time after getting out of the hospital from that, I knew I would never drink again. One time I drank right after getting out of the hospital. One time it was about three days after getting out of the hospital for the, uh, with the idea that if I just drank a small beer instead of a tall beer that it would be okay, it would be different. And if you eat a Slim Jim on top before that, that it could be stuck. <laughs> and uh, I, uh, I couldn't stay sober. I didn't know what was wrong with me. I didn't know anything about alcoholism. I didn't know anything about Alcoholics Anonymous or 12 Steps. Family didn't, didn't know, really know what to do with me. And if you'd asked me, I thought everybody gave up on me. It seemed like everybody did. And one day I was walking uh, to the grocery store to write a bad check, another bad check. I don't know if anybody's ever written any bad checks or not. But, yeah. And uh, something happened to me. It was like my whole life flashed before my eyes. It was not a blinding light spiritual experience thing like that it was just kind of a, a small moment of clarity where I uh, I just turned 22 years old and had this like thought that my life shouldn't be ending it should be it should begin should be beginning and I uh, I said two prayers out loud I said there's got to be something better than this and then I said God please help me and I've been sober ever since that moment and uh, I believe I've continued to grow and get better ever since that moment. My life is, life is visited many, many, many times. 
I don't want to imply that I've uh, I've had life's all been a bunch of you know fruity pebbles and foot massages, but um, <laughs> I like a good foot massage. Um, I don't even know if they make fruity pebbles anymore. But um, <laughs> what would happen is I would uh, I'd be introduced that same day that I gave surrendered. I through a series of coincidences, I ended up in a detox, and a guy from Alcoholics Anonymous came in and started and talked to me. And I know today that that guy was carrying out a primary purpose and that that, that, that guy was, was practicing traditions in his life by, by carrying the message into that detox to where I was at. And he told me a few things about his life and what he had done and I had never heard anything like that. It was, it, was, it was a new experience to hear this guy talking about the way that he drank and things that had happened to him and there was an identification there that I had never had with the preachers and the psychiatrist and the first sergeant and the deputy and the father-in-law and the next door neighbor's dog that tried to help me <laughs> uh, and that identification that that we talk about in in the third tradition and the fifth tradition is extremely important to recovery uh, matter of fact the book says if there's no identification there's no recovery no identification and little can be done for the alcoholic and I knew that whatever that guy had, that I had it, and that he gave me hope that maybe that I could get better since he had gotten better. He'd been sober a number of years. <laughs> and, and, and basically what, happened, what, what would happen to me is that I would start going to Alcoholics Anonymous meetings, and <coughs> by going to meetings and getting a sponsor and taking those steps almost immediately, um, Slowly over time, my life started to change, and that I I realized I learned that I had a spiritual illness. That that that's what alcoholism is. It's a spiritual illness. The book calls it a spiritual malady, and that it can only be overcome by a <clears throat> spiritual experience, and that it's not an illness that's fixed by therapy and medication and some kind of operation mm -hmm. or or medical procedure that it's, it, we overcome it through taking the 12 steps and having a spiritual awakening and then our life be, uh, becomes purposeful and we try to carry that message to other people. And that by doing that, uh, we get to stay sober and we get to have a good life. And that's been my experience. And, um, and I've been trying to live that way ever since the, the day that I came into Alcoholics Anonymous. Now, I don't want to imply that I've been perfect or anything like that because I haven't. And, uh, but Alcoholics Anonymous has made the difference between life and death for me. And that Alcoholics Anonymous has made the difference between misery and, uh, and serenity and misery and sobriety. And uh, I'm just, I'm extremely grateful to, to be a member of Alcoholics Anonymous and to, to, to be able to follow people and to be able to learn from people that truly have practiced a program as a way of life and not just some kind of first aid kit for not drinking and not just something that, that they go to, like going to a meeting. Um, that meetings are just a very small part of what, of what we do. Um, these folks have practiced Alcoholics Anonymous as a way of life and that they take God and they take the program with them everywhere they go. It took me a few years to understand them to actually do that. I, uh, I, I failed at it miserably for about four or five years. Uh, but when I started doing it, my, my life completely changed. And I'm a guy that, so I'm, I, know I'm, I know what I'm supposed to talk about, living the tradition. Well, I don't. So here's, I guess, the first thing I want to say is that, that I'm not an expert on alcoholics dominance. I'm not an expert on traditions or steps. Um, but I am a guy that's been sober for way over half of my life. And I'm, I'm not a guy that has never not gone to meetings. I've never not used a sponsor. I've never not prayed. I've never not helped anybody so those are four things that I can absolutely with confidence stand up in front of you and tell you that I have always gone to meetings I've always stayed current with my sponsor I've always prayed and I've always tried to help other people I've never stopped that no matter how good or bad my life has gotten I've never stopped doing those things and it's never failed me um, so that's that's really what I want to talk about I uh, there's a few problems with all that because 
given the topic, um, I mean, a lot of it is my experience. Some of it is probably opinion and uh, trying to, to talk about how to apply those steps in, or those traditions in, in your personal life and not a whole lot specifically written in the literature about that. Um, and I know that whenever I'm sitting out there or used to when I'm sitting out there and some clown in a goofy sport coat would get up and talk like I'm talking, I would always try to compare and judge and, well, that's not right, that's not right, and then I would kind of miss the message. So all I want to do is really maybe uh, for you to open up your mind a little bit and have, and, and, and you got to use your imagination a little bit with some of the, with some of the stuff that we're going to talk about. Maybe just see how it can apply instead of how it doesn't apply. Um, and there's a few things in the book that, that are interesting to me. Um, I don't refer to this book much, although it saved my life. Um, <laughs> but I don't, I, don't, I don't read from it much, but there's something interesting. And on page 19 it says, We feel that elimination of our drinking is but a beginning. A much more important demonstration of our principles lies before us in our respective homes, occupations, and affairs. So on page 19 of the book, that's pretty much in the beginning of it, it already talks about just not drinking ain't enough. Um, that we've got to, it's more important to actually demonstrate the principles of the program at home, at work, and in everything that we do. I mean, it, it basically tells us that right at the very, at the very beginning, that that's, that that's basically what we're supposed to do. We have a lot of we have a lot of workshops in AA or a lot of talk about emotional sobriety. Anybody ever heard about that? Um, kind of a goofy word to me, but I would submit to you that for me, the traditions have way more utility to them in terms of everyday life and about how to interact with people and how to get along in society than the steps do. And that the steps certainly set us up in a position to, to, to live free. Um, but if I want to learn how to get along with other people, and I want to learn how to actually make a living and not be in debt, and if I want to learn how to actually get along with people that I don't necessarily like or agree with, the principles that are the, the, of the traditions, for me, are they have a lot more value in, in a lot of cases than... Than, uh, than the steps do. And they're really the key to, if you want emotional sobriety, which whatever that is, I would, I mean, I guess it's just maybe relating to the world without a whole lot of drama and emotion maybe. Uh, I think that the traditions, the, the traditions really, <coughs> really do it for me. And it's interesting because they ask me to lay aside personal ambition. They ask me to lay aside my selfishness and my self-centeredness. Even in our own groups, that's what the traditions do is they, they ask us to lay aside what sometimes what we think is best, sometimes what we want. Um, and it's interesting in the very beginning of the book on, uh, I'll read a couple other things here if I can find them. Step 12, right, says, having had a spiritual awakening, as a result of these steps, we tried to carry this message to alcoholics. Great instructions on the book, in the book on how to carry a message, and then practice principles in all our affairs. So the question I always has, well, how do I practice principles in all my affairs? I think that a good way to do that is, is the steps. I mean, is the traditions. If I'm going to, if I'm going to try to practice principles everywhere that I go, the traditions help me do that. And then it says in the beginning of the book, at the second, forward to the second edition, when AA is starting to grow. It talks about are there going to be quarrels over money? Well, have you ever had a quarrel over money in your personal life? Yeah, yeah, never. Um, <laughs> or it talks about how can we work together? Well, you, if you if you've had a job, yeah, good question. Well, how do I work together? Or how do I work together with my family? It talks about how do we live together? How do we be more effective? Right? It talks about are there going to be strivings for power and for prestige? Well, these are all things that we struggle with in our personal lives, you know, a lot of us, and the, tra the traditions help with that. The first tradition talks about unity. So I, I would, for me, unity is kind of a byproduct of a way of life. I mean, I just don't, 
I'm just not unified. I'm just not immediately, you know, practicing unity. I think for me that if I'm if I'm living the the traditions two through twelve, then unity is kind of a byproduct of living that way. That if I'm if I'm trying to apply, and we'll go through those here in just a few minutes. But if I'm trying to apply those uh, those next eleven traditions, then unity is kind of just the byproduct of me practicing that way of life. Um, but the first one specifically talks about that each member is a small part of a great whole. See, I'm a guy that, before I got sober, I was never a part of anything. I was completely separated from the world. I was, depending on the circumstances, I was either better than you or less than you. And typically, typically, I felt less than. But I was never like just one among many. I was never just you know, an, an average guy. I always was either way worse or way better depending on the circumstances. And what the, I think the steps helped me do that. The steps helped me kind of get right with the world. And the steps helped me with, with self-esteem and helped me to realize that I'm no better or no less. Um, but the first tradition basically really te- teaches me that, hey, there's more to the world than me. And if my trouble is selfishness and self-centeredness and everything's about me, 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 I don't know if anybody's ever felt like that, but uh, I mean, it's all about me. And the first tradition about common welfare comes first. It tells me that I should probably think about other people. It tells me that I probably should ask myself the question, hey, how do I want to live? Do I really want to live a life of service? Do I really want to, to be helpful to other people? Or do I just want to continue to be the, you know, the angry little punk that I was when I got here? and uh, you know, try to get everybody to do what I want them to do. Um, so what the first tradition for me does is that it, it teaches me that I should start asking questions like, well, what's best for other people? What's, uh, what's best for the most people? And start making decisions uh, based on that. That maybe I should talk to people before I just make, make crazy decisions. We'll talk a little bit more about a little bit more about that um, in a little bit. The second tradition talks about there's one ultimate authority, a loving God. So I could talk. We could talk all night on on tradition two. Actually, the first two. But but the question I ask my me personally is who's the one ultimate authority in my life? After taking those steps. And having that spiritual awakening and, and basically forming a relationship with God is the ultimate authority in my life still me? Is it still my own crazy ass thinking? Or is it my is it the relationship I'm in? Is it my job? Right? Do I let do I let the relationship dominate me? Is that my ultimate authority? Or is my work and the striving for money my, my ultimate authority? The tradition all those things, are, or is it the car and the house and all that stuff's nice? There's nothing wrong with having any of it, but if it if it becomes more important than God, then I'm in trouble. The second tradition tells me that I should have one ultimate authority. It's it's a loving God, and that's what I found in Alcoholics Anonymous is that I found a power that is loving and caring that cares for me, and that 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 should be the the, the ultimate. <coughs> source that I go to for for power each day and I shouldn't look to other things the other outside things to, have to to provide that power and then the question would be am I going to use that power and am I going to use that power as the guide for all of my decisions it also talks about group conscience and uh, that I would submit to you if you're going to listen for a group conscience if you're going to hear a group conscience you got to listen and to me, it's one of the most least understood traditions in, in Alcoholics Anonymous. Because um, it, it always, in the group, it always gets to I'm right and you're wrong. And this tells me that I should listen for a loving God through the combined input and combined experience and influences of each person. And that. So the question would be, do I, do I listen? Personally, the way I would apply this is that, see, I'm not, 
I didn't just wake up one day and become a good listener. As a matter of fact, I don't listen very well because what I do is, and I had this experience with my wife, but what I do when people come and talk to me <coughs> is while you're talking to me, I'm formulating my response. <laughs> And I'm already kind of predicting what I'm going to say, and I'm, I'm going to hit you with some good stuff based on my experience. <laughs> right? And uh, instead of just listening without any kind of formulating any opinions or formulating a response, um, this tells me that I should listen <coughs> for the loving God that's inside of everybody. That I should actually just listen to people without having to have a response. I learned this through one time with my wife one time. She she, we were sitting there a long time ago, and she was saying something about how her day was and how things were going, and she got done. And, of course, I'm in, like, help sponsor mode. I started shooting <laughs> solutions at her, like, unsolicited. And she's like, hey, she says, I wasn't asking, I wasn't asking for your input or any help. I just wanted you to listen. And uh, it hit me. I mean, it was like, man, I, I should just... She didn't ask for any response. Just listen. And uh, I learned that in Alcoholics Anonymous. I learned that, how to do that in Alcoholics Anonymous, that I should, there's a, that, uh, there's an old slogan, it's not an A slogan, seek first to understand and to be understood. I think it's in the prayer in that, in the 12 and 12, in that St. Francis prayer. Mm -hmm. But that's a good, that's a very good uh slogan for the second tradition seek first to understand and be understood that I should try to listen to people that I should try to uh, uh, listen to the wisdom of many and that there's wisdom in, in, in people so most of the time if I have a major decision to make in my personal life I'll run it by a couple of people that have experience with that and, and instead of just making a decision on my own um, the third tradition talks about so, that, so those first two traditions, I mean, I think that they're, they're for me, they're a very good way to, li to live, just you know, power with people is better than power over people. That if I listen to the combined experience of others, that, that, uh, that I tend to make better decisions. Uh, I'll tell you one work experience with, with that, like that first tradition. We, uh, this was years ago. I'm going to wrap up on time. Don't worry. I'm going to fly through some of them. The, uh, <laughs> um, talking about the common welfare and, and listening. Years ago, when I worked for the telephone company, we opened up a retail store in, in Raleigh. It was the first retail st in the cell phone business. This would have been back in the early 90s. It was the very first retail store ever opened. And... Um, None of us had any experience with retail, and we were too arrogant to hire somebody that had experience with, uh, with retail. So we thought we knew everything, but anyway, we, we opened up this store up in North Raleigh, and we were covering a crazy amount of hours. We were open from like 9 to 9, and we were open on Saturday and Sunday, and I was responsible for the schedule for about seven or eight employees. Actually, it was nine employees. And so I, I'd make the schedule and send it out, and people would bitch about it and complain, and I'd put it back out, and they would complain, and people would come to me. And I know this sounds like everybody should know this, but one day I was talking, I was thinking about these traditions. I'm like, well, maybe we should ask these people when they want to work and when they don't want to work, when they can work and when they can't work. Maybe we should get everybody together and... <laughs> come up with a schedule that works for everybody. Well, you know what? We did that. My goodness, people were excited. Everybody was like, well, yeah, I can, I can work that time. I, I, I can cover that time. And I never, had to do a, I never had to do a schedule after that. I gave it to them and let them do it. And uh, I mean, that's an example where you, you think it would make sense to just ask people when they can work and when they can't work instead of dictating to them. Um, but by bringing them and getting them involved and letting them do it, never had a problem after that. All the hours always got covered, and uh, the store did incredibly well. Um, third tradition. So the, in AA, the third tradition says that our membership ought to include all who suffer from alcoholism. And it says we basically shouldn't exclude anybody. If they got an alcohol problem, we should welcome them. That, that would mean... Uh, 
white people, black people, Chinese people, purple people, gay people, straight people, people that don't know, on and on and on. And I see that as very, very um, inclusive and ve uh, <clears throat> very, very non-prejudiced. So Alcoholics Anonymous isn't prejudiced against anybody. And I grew up in a prejudice, somewhat of a prejudiced family. And um, I never really complete, completely agreed with some of the ideas of my, of my grandparents. My, my parents weren't, weren't, weren't real prejudiced. But what this tradition has taught me is that, that I should try to not have any prejudice towards people. That, that that's a perfect ideal to live towards. But, but I should be welcoming to all. And that I should try to, going back to those first two traditions, I should try to understand people before I start judging them. And I should, should probably get to know somebody before I just start making assumptions. Now, that can be hard to do. Um, I'll tell you, like, so my, uh, an example of that would be my, my family now with nieces and nephews, even my wife's family, <coughs> nieces and nephews, some of them have, uh, have started marrying and having children with, it's, it's interracial. And, of course, there's people in the family that don't agree with that and don't like that, and you can hear them making comments and all that. I don't participate in that. I try to support them regardless of who they are, and I try to just to be a good uncle or a, a good cousin, whatever the case may be. And I learned that through alcoholics Anonymous. I learned that uh, it, it's just it's not my place to, to judge and to try to tell people what they can and cannot do. Um, I even... In that, in that same cell phone business, uh, another example of that was, I, back in the early 90s, we were hiring people for, uh, to install phones. Wallace used to install phones a long time ago for the phone company. Y'all know that. And uh, there were no female installers in that business at all back then. And I hired, like, the first female installer in the state of North Carolina in that, in that, in that business. And I can remember people were all worried about that, and they were concerned about that. And I'm like, I'm trying to hire the most qualified person. And that's what we did, and she worked out just fine. But that's an example of where if I had just gone with the norm and the, the, you know, the standard, um, you know, probably would have missed that opportunity for, for a good employee. So, so really that's what the third tradition to me in my personal life, what that means is that, that I should – if I'm going to be helpful, and if I'm going to try to uh, to, to really be of service to where I go, I need to I need to look at the again that that loving God that's in people, not not what they look like on the outside. And well, I'm I'm typically when I judge people by the way they look, I'm typically wrong, almost every time. You probably had that experience. The book uh, there's a there's a good good uh, good thing in the book that I learned. It's on page 28. It says, it, so this was written in 39, 38. If what we have learned and felt and seen means anything at all, it means that all of us, whatever our race, creed, or color, are the children of a living creator with whom we may form a relationship upon simple and understandable terms as soon as we are willing and honest enough to try. And... That's on page 28 in the book. So the book is telling us early on that that, that sums up those first three traditions, that there's a loving God that cares for everybody regardless of who you are. And that same love and kindness was extended to me by God and by people. Why, shouldn't, why wouldn't I ex ex extend that to other people? Number four talks about uh, uh, that groups aren't responsible to any other authority than its own conscience. <coughs> except when their plans maybe uh, are going to uh, impact somebody else. So I, this, is a, this is a pretty cool tra tradition to me in my personal life. It, it tells me that, that I can basically you know, I can do what I want to do unless what I'm going to do is going to impact somebody else. So I should, if I'm going to make a decision, I should probably run it by somebody if it's going to impact them. Like if I'm going to go buy a brand new uh, motorboat, I might want to talk to my wife before I go do it. <laughs> right? 
Now I can tell you when I was drinking, if if I, I was never in a position to buy a boat, but if I was ever <laughs> if I ever was in a position to buy a boat, I probably wouldn't ask anybody. I probably would just I would probably just go do it. Um, at work, you know, if I'm going to make a decision that's going to impact somebody else, um, like for a period of time, I ran a region. There were three regions in the company, and we had autonomy to kind of do do our own <clears throat> stuff. We had a certain amount of guidelines we had to follow, but one day we made me and a, my work group decide we were going to have make a have this major promotion, and it would it would kind of bleed into the other regions. Well, I could have easily made the decision to do it and not tell anybody, uh, but because of this tradition, they were neighboring me, and the, the decision would ultimately impact them and probably create some confusion within their customer base. So I called and talked to them first. I learned that through this tradition. Whereas my old style would be, the damn king, I can do what I want to do. They, they just had to deal with it. That's not in line with the tradition. <laughs> it also tells me to let other people have their own experience. Right? It says, it talks about autonomy and giving people autonomy. And I'm a guy that wants to jump in and fix people, and I want to, I want to, I want to kind of steer your your experience through my experience and let me help you and here's why. And th this tells me in, in a lot of aspects to let others have their own experience. Give people freedom to make their own mistakes or to learn or to maybe not make a mistake, to have their own success. And that when people make mistakes, I should support them. And yeah, you know, not not say I told you so. I like saying that one too. Um, <laughs> but this tells me to not do that. That, yeah. You know, uh... Now I wish my wife would practice this one. No, she... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she has. Yeah, she she has bought a couple of cars without consulting with me <laughs> in the past. <laughs> Crazy. We moved. We, I got relocated up to Ohio one time, and I was up there visiting. I hadn't, we hadn't moved yet, but she heard there was a lot of snow up there, and I could fly back probably one night, and she comes and picks me up, and I jump in. It's a brand new car or four wheel drive. I was like, "I said, whose car is this?" She said, "Oh, it's mine. I went and bought it." <laughs> Got to have that four wheel drive up in the snow. I was like, "Okay." I never once asked her anything else about it after that. AA, AA gave that to me. <laughs> it's true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, you know, I don't, I don't. And it, it talks about having authority over things. I don't have any authority over anybody. I don't want authority over anybody today. I mean, I, I, I'm one of those guys. When I was told that I didn't have to keep running the show, I was happy about that. That's just nerve wracking in your mind. So the fourth tradition really tells me that not to have any authority. Even my pets. I try not to have authority over them. I let them do what they want to do. Now, now within reason. You, I'm going to temper that with, within reason. But con even like my nieces and nephews, constantly like some of their parents, no, no, don't do that, no. I, I don't do that. I try to help them. I try to let him have their own experience. If if he wants to burn himself with the candle, let him do it one day. <laughs> right? If she wants to climb up on those cabinets, she, let her do it one time and have the experience. There's nothing wrong with that. I mean, constantly putting a child on guard, that's just that's no way to to, to do anything. Number five says uh, talks about a primary purpose. Um some of y'all in the, in the, uh, have worked at corporate, in corporate jobs or for big companies. It used to be really cool to have a mission statement. Right? And we spent years, we spent hours in meetings writing mission statements and coming up with all this great stuff. And then the mission statement would go up on the wall and it would go out to customers and nobody would do it. Um, so, uh, yeah, you, you, some of y'all have had that experience. But this tells me to have a primary purpose. So obviously Alcoholics Anonymous has given me a purpose. I don't wake up in the morning wondering who I am or what I'm supposed to be doing. I, I have it for years. I know who I am and, and I know what my job is. My job is to, to serve God and try to help other people. And that comes in different forms obviously. Um, 
and I try not to deviate from that. And I try to only participate in things that support that. I try to only hang out with people that support that. I try to only spend my time in places that support that. I don't hang out with losers. I don't go to, to crazy places. And I don't hang out in places that it's just not productive. That's just the way that I live. I learned that by this tradition. It also tells me, though, that I do have, like at work, I got a primary purpose. My job at work should be to do the job that they pay me to do. Not surf the internet, not get on Facebook, not go in the conference room or the, the break room and gossip about little Susie and what her and Jimmy and what they did, or, uh, or to talk about the next merger or the people that are breaking up. Um, when I met, I should, I should do the job they pay me to do. When I go visit my mom, I leave my phone in the car. I go in there to spend time with her and to hang out with her. Wherever, and so that, that's just part of trying to wherever, be where you are and, you know, try to be present where you are. And that's kind of what, what, that's, what that's taught me. Um, some of that's just personal personal preference. I I mean I, you know I'm a guy that gets distracted easily, and you know you know I've heard throughout the years by certain people, well you're not present when you're here, so I just try to be present. I try to carry out that the purpose of wherever of wherever I'm at. I'm a guy that doesn't take a cell phone into a meeting. I uh, I would submit to you that. I've had a cell phone ever since, I don't know, 89, 90, right after I got sober. But I probably might be one of the first A members that had a handheld cell phone because I worked for the company and they would send us the phones before they hit the market. I've never felt the need to carry one into a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I don't say that to tell you that you shouldn't do it. I'm just telling you that it's a distraction. And that, that what I do is, I want to get on it real quick. And the next thing I know, the new guy's going out the door. And uh, even reading the books and stuff on those things, it's, I, I can't read a book on it because I'm reading the book. And then the text comes by. I check that real quick. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I missed the prayer. So I leave that damn thing in the phone, in the car. Um, and I try to have just a few things that I do right instead of trying to be all over the board. That's what the tradition, the fifth tradition has taught me. The, the sixth one, one of my favorites, talks about problems of money, property, and authority easily diverged from our primary spiritual aim. Um, the way I do that personally is I try to let money, a job, property, a relationship, prestige, my ego, get in the way of, of my spiritual development. And that comes in a lot of forms. It's prayer, it's meditation, it's going to meetings, it's helping other people, it's just trying to be a good guy, and that I don't, I, I don't let any of that interfere with. I mean, before I got sober, I didn't have a job. Before I got sober, I didn't have any money. Before I got sober, my relationships were in the in the, in the grave. I had a bad reputation. Alcoholics Anonymous is the catalyst that fixed all that. When I got sober and started practicing spiritual principles, I got a job. <clears throat> when I got sober and started practicing spiritual principles, I got into a, a healthy relationship. <clears throat> Took a while. <clears throat> so I got sober, my, my life started getting cleaned up, my, my, my reputation, the way people thought about me improved. Why would I turn away from the only thing that fixed all that? It makes doesn't make any sense to me, so that's why I, I mean I, I don't let anything and, and I'm a guy that I've had a uh, a tremendous amount of success with what or what people would consider success with 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 job and stuff in the community and and finances and um, I've never I've I've left people at the at the at the board table got on a plane and catch my hunger. Luckily, I was in a position where I could do that. But I've left my boss sitting over at the office in RTP because I had to go to my home group. I, I don't, now I know there's exceptions. Sometimes you've got to miss. But that's just, it's just, a, it's just a principle that I try to practice. I don't let that stuff get, get in the way. I'll tell you what happens. 
and where this ties in really good, if I can find it here. Page 85 in the big book. This is what that tradition talks about. <coughs> this is at step 10. It's easy to let up on the spiritual program of action and rest on our laurels. We are headed for trouble if we do. So, if I start breaking spiritual commitments for something that's goofy and silly, um, I'm in trouble. So I try not to do that. Seven talks about being fully self-supporting. Before I got here, I wasn't fully self-supporting. I relied on other people to pay my bills for me. I mean, I'd pay bills every once in a while, but if things got in a bad condition, I just I just expected other people to do it. That ain't that ain't those aren't just millennials that do that. Hell, I did. I don't know. I don't know. Heidi, Brian. I mean, I, I don't. Know. I mean, we act like that's something new. My goodness, I mooched off of people and I was lazy long, long before millennials were even born. <laughs> and I, I expected other people to, to do stuff for me. And really what this tells me is that, you know, to pay my own way, don't do anything I can't afford, to, you know, to try to, to live within my means. I, uh, and I didn't always do that. It took me, it took me several years in sobriety. I mean, I got divorced in sobriety after about four years, and I was in a lot of debt. And I brought that into a new marriage. And at one time, I don't know, we, we were, I was, I don't know, I was probably about $50,000 in debt and had a car payment and a mortgage payment and was just tired of living that way. And we, we wrote, me and my wife wrote out a plan, and we prayed about it, and over a period of time, we we got completely out of debt. The tradition and Alcoholics Anonymous <laughs> taught me to do that. And I've been trying to live that way. It's not always easy. I mean, living, living, in, living life today can be difficult. Trying to make a living can be difficult. There's no doubt about that. Um, but if you try to, you know, for me, when I tried to just live within my means and when I tried to be prayerful about it and when I tried to have a little bit of faith <coughs> and I actually started giving money away even when I didn't have any, that spiritual principle, um, it's never failed me. It, it's, it's, it's never failed me. My financial situation changed drastically about three years ago when I left the corporate world. I've never continued, I've never stopped giving money away. It's just a, it's just a faithful practice that I have, and I believe that if I give back, I'm going to get back, and that, that's worked for me. Um, so that's what the seventh tradition means, is that I try to just live within my means and not not uh, not do anything that I can't afford. Um, but I love spending money now. <laughs> I ain't going to lie about it, especially other people's money. Um, <laughs> eight, eight tells me to, uh, talks about uh, AA's non-professional, <coughs> right, so we don't have any paid 12-steppers. Um, and... For, personally, for me, what this means, AA is made up of a lot of talented people, right? Aside from drinking, we're, we got everything in here tonight. You, I mean, we got a lot of people with lots of talents, lots of experience, lots of, uh, of uh, you know, gifts. And what this tells me is that I should share those gifts for free and for fun, not just in AA, but outside. And that that... Because of Alcoholics Anonymous, I've been able to get involved in the community. Um, I've been able to, to support organizations like Junior Achievement and teach kids about uh, entrepreneurship and capitalism in school. I've helped out boys and girls clubs uh, with time and with uh, uh, like coaching and, and, and money. Uh, I've been able to support, you know, help the homeless, homelessness in, in Raleigh and Wake County. Um, and giving back my time for free is just a part of stewardship in our society. And that's what the tradition taught me, that I should do that and not expect anything in return. Um, now, it also tells me, because <coughs> the second part of that talks about we have paid staff workers for stuff that people won't volunteer for. 
So I will hire a professional to do something. If you get a speeding ticket, it's a good idea to get a hire an attorney. <laughs> when I first started, got when I first got sober, I I got speeding tickets out the. I was so grateful it wasn't a DWI. I was like, yeah, give me a speeding ticket. <laughs> and, uh, uh, little known story, I actually lost my license sober because of speeding tickets. <laughs> if you get 12 points on your license, you don't take your license away from you. Did you know that? I, I got a careless and reckless for driving too fast. And uh, it gave as much points as a DWI. <laughs> I was grateful to get it. But anyway, the first time I got one of the speeding tickets, I went to court without an attorney. Oh, I'm going to go in there and show them. Well, that wasn't a good idea. The judge and the DA just don't like it. So, anyway. <laughs> I got a hot tub that broke down a few months ago. Well, I'm going to fix the hot tub myself. So, there was just a little part that I know this now. I didn't know it at the time when I was troubleshooting it because <laughs> I used to be an electrician in another life. Uh, I ended up blowing out the circuit board and it went from about a $25 repair to a $400 repair after I called a professional to come look at it. So I would utilize the right person for the right job. Now, I shouldn't skimp on that. Uh, that's what that tradition has told me. But more importantly, it, it's important for me to, to be of service in the community and, and not expect anything in return. Uh, Nine talks about not having a whole lot of organization and universal respect for others. Um, and it mentions trusted servant. Not a term that we use outside of AA much. Um, but and I'm talking about the long form. I think the short form says something completely different. I don't know what that says, what that means. <laughs> if you really want to know the intent of the traditions, read the long form. That's what I'm looking at in the book here. Um, but can people trust me? Am I reliable? I mean, before I got sober, I was unreliable. I'd make plans with you and never show up. I, would, I just never showed up. I never did anything I said I was going to do. I just wasn't in me. I had all these good intentions. But I just never could do it. It's probably one of the greatest things AA has taught me is to try to honor commitments and to try to be consistent. And I'm not always perfect at it, but but that's what that's what this tells me is that I should be I should be trusted. People should be able to rely on me. It also tells me that I, I, I don't agree to something that I can't do. So before if River asked me to fix his hot tub, yeah, I'm an expert at hot tubs. <laughs> right? Um but I try not to agree to do some, to get involved with something that I can't I can't do. Um, the simplicity part is uh, you know I try to travel light. I mean I don't try to accumulate a bunch of stuff and I don't hold on to possessions. I don't believe anything belongs to me. Um, even stuff that I've got, it's just all that stuff is just temporary. If I hold on to things thinking that this is mine, um, it's just not a, a a very spiritual way to live. Um, and that when I take on the commitment of doing something, I should try to do it, whatever that is. And my parents today, and now it took them a few years of me being sober for them to actually come to this. But when when I say I'm going to be at their house at 11, I'm there at 11. If I say I'm going to show up at the birthday party, I'm going to show up at the birthday party. Also, if I say I'm not going to be at the birthday party, I'm not going to be at the birthday party. <coughs> But I, I tell them the truth, and, and they, they know, they just expect that that's going to happen. Whereas before, they, okay, uh, you, you ain't going to be, we can't rely on you. Um, I'll tell you another thing that, on this. So, like, if I take on a, a job somewhere or a volunteer position, I should, I should do that. I used to be terrible for saying yes too quick. An example of that was I had a, a friend of mine one time ask me if I wanted to join Rotary. Yeah, I joined Rotary. I, I got no desire to be in Rotary. So anyway, I, after, I, mean, I said yes, and I'm like, well, I can't back down now. So I got involved with it. It's a great organization. Some of those guys are just as serious as we are. But, I mean, I was involved with them for about a year, and I finally, I'm like, you know what? This is just a, it's an, I was living an absolute lie. I had no, I mean, their cause is great, but it just wasn't me. I had no real desire or, 
to, to, to do any of that stuff. And I finally told them the truth. Man, you know what? I really can't commit time to this. It's not my passion. It's not my interest. Instead of just not showing up, I told them the truth and uh, walked away with a little bit of dignity. Is that clock right? <laughs> We're right on schedule. Ten talks about it. So, I, so uh, that's what that ninth one means to me is uh, try to uh, and try to practice universal respect for other people. Um, number ten. We could talk about this all day with all that's going on in the world. I'm going to try to uh, not do that. Um, it talks about expressing opinion on outside controversial issues. Um, here, here's what I would say about this one. Is here's what I know for sure. Is the truth never needs to be defended. <coughs> the truth is the truth. And for me to defend the truth, or to try to defend something that's not true is I'm wasting my time. Um, the serenity prayer helps me with that. If, there's, if there is something I'm, that I'm passionate about that I can actually make a difference, I'll do that. If there's something that I can't, I won't be divisive and, and just squeak noise to, to piss people off. It's just not a good spiritual way to live. Um, so i got to ask myself, can I be helpful or am I just going to be divisive? And if the answer is I'm, I can be helpful, then I'll, I'll be helpful. I'll temper that with some love and tolerance. Um, that, you know, it doesn't mean that I don't have opinions. But, you know, in society, I mean, you can either be helpful or you can, you can be a jerk. I mean, the, the, choice is, the choice is mine. Sometimes it can be, it can be hard to know when to, when, where that balance is. Um, I, I'll tell you something interesting happened. I had a guy last week ask if he could meet with me, and he had, he had just moved here. I shouldn't say this, but I'm going to say it. But he just moved here from another state. He's been sober for a, a number of years, and I suspected he called me wanting to talk about sponsorship. Well, in the course of the conversation, I could tell that that was kind of what it was, and he was asking me these loaded questions. He, he thought he was being really smooth about it, he was asking me these questions to try to figure out what my political views were before he asked me to sponsor him. And I didn't, I didn't bite. That is not, that's completely not within what we're about. I can help you regardless of what our differences are. You can help me regardless of what our differences are. And if I'm going to put a criteria like that on whether, you know, I'm going to let you help me or not or whether I'm going to help you or not, that's certainly not within the, the principles of, of the, the program. Um, there's a term that Emmett Fox uses a lot called non-resistance. I don't know if anybody knows who Emmett Fox is. I know some of y'all read him. But it's also a term that my sponsor used to use a lot. It's non practice non-resistance. And what that means is that it doesn't mean that I don't have ideas and opinions and stuff, but I don't impose them on people. And I, I trust the, the, the realm of spirit. I trust the spiritual process of stuff for everything just to work out. That doesn't mean I'm naive. That just means that I trust the, the process of stuff and that the truth will always come out. Whether I, you know, And that's going to happen regardless of what I do. I, mean, I, I can make it easy on myself or bad or hard. Um, 11 and 12 talk about anonymity. They talk about my, one of my favorite pieces in the book. Um, there's never a need to praise ourselves. So you're going to get a little opinionated, but that means I don't have to put, look, put my chip on Facebook. Um, I don't have to talk on Facebook or on social media uh, about how great I am today because I've been sober for four years. That's praising myself. The book is very clear. The tradition is very clear that, and if you do do that, that's fine. I, I would never say anything to anybody about doing it. Unless it was Brian. Um, <laughs> um, but my works speak for me. The way that I walk speaks for me. The, the way that I help other people or interact with other people speak for me. I, I don't have to do it. I... Um, I, I I was on a job a 
corporate job for 24 years and went from basically sweeping the floor to, to being a, a president of one of their companies. I never asked for a raise in those years. I never asked for a promotion. And I got that guidance from some very good, from a very good sponsor and a business mentor that you don't, you don't have to do that, that you work <coughs> and your results speak for yourself. People notice and you, you, you get what you get when you get it. And that's, a, that's just a, a, a principle that has worked well for me, that I don't have to promote myself. I don't have to do that. I, uh, I've been asked to speak at several funerals for family members because the, the walk that I started practicing alcoholics anonymous showed my family that I was worthy of doing it. I didn't ask to do that. I was at a high school reunion one time. I, this is a stupid story. I don't like telling it, but I was at a high school reunion one time, and they started giving out awards for like people that had traveled the farthest, people that had been married the longest, people that had, I don't know, on and on and on. Well, they gave an award for the person that had changed the most. Mm. Now, 98% of those people I had never seen since high school. And somehow the word had traveled that Jerry had changed the most. And they gave me the award. But that's an example of how this tradition of just doing what we do and trying to be helpful to others speaks louder than words. Right? I don't, I don't have to praise myself. I don't have to get involved in any kind of <coughs> sensationalism or, or drama about myself. That the that the the tradition tells me to uh, to be thankful of the blessings that God has given me, and to always remember that those blessings come from God, that loving God that I talked about earlier, not from me, and that that I don't have to be out here. Uh, <coughs> You know, overly uh, look at me, look at me, look at me. That's our, that's our problem. That's the, that's the root of our trouble. So I want people to look at me. I want everybody to look at me. I'm about out of time here. Um, so the tradition of anonymity. I mean, it's uh, you know it tells us to put, put principles before personalities. I think that rolls up all of those traditions. That it did take me a while to realize that. I got to put my principle, my personality. <coughs> yes, something. I used to think it was your prince, your personality before principles. It's not your personality; it's mine. There's nothing wrong with anybody else. There's a lot wrong with me. That all I can fix is myself, and that I need to put principles before my personality. So that that my job is to try to interact with people and to try to be the, the most helpful that I can be. So that I can uh, continue to stay sober and, and be of service to, uh, to to that loving God, Alcoholics Anonymous is, is again has made the difference between death and, and life, and um, my job is to try to, to carry that to other people. And if I'm caught up and wrapped up in myself, I can't do that. So I appreciate y'all listening to me. Thank you.